let's go ahead and get started. Welcome all of you who have braved the weather, this unusual weather for late, late in March. And for those of you joining us via Zoom webinar, um, we're real pleased to have you with us as well. And I know some of you on Zoom probably would like to have been here in person. So welcome to the, this is the 2022 McDonald Distinguished Lecture. And we're very pleased to have with us tonight, Mr. John McDonald, and he's here for an exciting lecture. Our speaker is Professor Vicki Caspi from McGill University in Montreal, where she's the Lauren Trottier Professor of Astrophysics and Director of the McGill Space Institute. Professor Caspi's research centers on observational studies of neutron stars using radio and X-ray telescopes. She's especially well known for her work on magnetars, highly magnetized neutron stars, Professor Caspi leads the collaboration responsible for the CHIME telescope project. It's a unique and relatively new radio telescope located in British Columbia. And she is leading in the discovery of, and it is leading in the discovery of fast radio bursts. And she is a leader of that effort. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including election to the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Society of London, the US National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and recently the 2021 Shaw Prize in Astronomy for her work on magnetars. Professor Caspi has an extensive record of doing groundbreaking work in numerous areas of astrophysics, and we are pleased and fortunate to have her with us delivering the McDonald Distinguished Lecture on the Fast Radio Sky. Professor Caspi. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real uh, honor, pleasure to be here. I just want to be sure everybody can hear me well. Good, good, excellent. So I'm, uh, I'm very excited to, to, to tell you about uh, this research area where you know, I've given, you, given the title the fast radio sky. You'll see by the end uh, what I mean by that. Uh, when people ask me uh, what I'm working on these days, I say, I, I don't know because we really don't know what this new astrophysical phenomenon called fast radio bursts are. Uh, and I would like to unpack all that information for you um, next. But uh, really what you're gonna hear now is not just about this one astrophysical phenomenon, but it's a sort of cosmic detective story and, and really a tale about how, how science progresses. How do, we, uh, how do we do science? How do we, how do we solve you know, a, a, an, an interesting puzzle. There'll be twists and turns and surprises uh, all over the place, and, and I, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, this phenomenon that I'm going to talk about, these fast radio bursts, they, they've gotten quite a bit of press. You can, you can Google it, and you'll see we've been in uh, all sorts of different um, um, uh, news outlets, uh, you know, flashes in the sky, the mystery of fast radio bursts. It's something that's truly unexpected. We'd, we'd never thought we would see these short bursts of, of radio waves everywhere, as, as I'll explain. Uh, and um, uh, probably it's gotten a little bit of uh, a press because some people have suggested that it might be something, uh, you know, extraterrestrial intelligence signals like that. And, and no, we, we do not think it's anything like that. Right at the outset, I want to make that clear. We believe this is a natural phenomenon. Uh, still very interesting, though. Uh, but first, you know, when I say radio, fast radio bursts, this, some people of, of, uh, of my, my generation and, and older will, will think of radio. Uh, there's a radio. The younger people don't know what this thing is. It's a strange device. I'm going to explain to the young people what this object is. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a device that detects radio waves uh, using this antenna over here. And it, uh, in this case, uh, there's a lot of uh, analog electronics inside there that converts the radio signal to, to sound that you can hear. And you have a dial here that you can tune to amplify the sound if, if you want, uh, but also to tune the radio frequency. That is to choose the equivalent of the color of radio waves that you're going to listen to. You can turn it and, and you can pick up individual 
uh, radio stations, if you want. And, and I know in, in Montreal, if you turn to 97.7 megahertz, uh, that's a good rock and roll station that I like to listen to. Uh, so just, just keeping that in mind, there's different frequencies of radio waves. Uh, and really, you know, so radio waves, when I say, you know, a certain color of radio waves, you could, you could think of it that, that, that way because radio waves just really are another kind of light. Uh, we're used to light being what our eyes can see, and that certainly is a type of, obviously a type of light, but radio waves are, are a different type of light. If, if, if our eyes were antennas, uh, we'd be able to see these things flying everywhere uh, right now to your cell phones, to uh, your radio stations. Radio waves just, um, uh, you know, here is the, the small portion of a, of a full spectrum of different colors of light, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the optical region, the visible region, our eyes are, are tuned just, just to that. But you can go beyond uh, the visible in, in, into the uh, shorter. This is uh, really the difference between all of these, these colors is uh, uh, the frequency or, or the wavelength. You can think about it in terms of frequency, if, if you like. Higher frequency uh, goes in this direction. So, uh, you know, you know, it goes from blue to purple in the rain, colors of the rainbow. Beyond purple, that's the ultraviolet, the ultraviolet, uh, and then it goes to X-rays and gamma rays. But there's also on the other side of the visible spectrum in the colors of the rainbow, you have the red and beyond red is the infrared, and then uh, going to smaller and smaller frequencies down to microwaves and, and, and radio waves. So this is a, a full spectrum, and, and I'm talking about radio light. So the, the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that's, that's over here. That's what this, this talk is, is addressing. Um, so what are these fast radio bursts? Uh, first of all, we detect them. We can't, with our eyes can't see them, but we can see them with radio telescopes, telescopes that are sensitive to cosmic radio waves like this uh, wonderful uh, telescope in Parks, Australia. This is, just to set the scale here, this is a 64 meter, 64 meters dish. This is a three-story building under here. I actually spent, uh, I don't know, most of six months in my life. I have my PhD as a student living in, living, almost living in there. This telescope will come back again in the talk. Uh, so for these fast radio bursts, they consist of short bursts of radio waves that last just a millisecond. That is a thousandth, thousandth of a second coming from random directions on the sky, these little flashes of radio light. This is a, a phenomenon that was first reported in 2007, discovered kind of by accident, kind of by accident, uh, using this telescope by, by uh, actually friends of mine uh, who were using uh, this, this radio telescope. Uh, so the first one um, was discovered in 2007, a short burst of radio waves. And you might wonder, well, lots of, there's lots of radio waves on Earth. How do you know it's not, you know, some, some cell phone tower or, you know, some airplane or something using radio waves? How do you know it's uh, cosmic? And I'll, I'm going to explain that. But for the moment, except that we know it is cosmic. And from the, the, the uh, number now, we know as of about uh, 10 years later, as of about 2017, there have been a few dozen of these events seen. And from no, seeing them all over the sky and knowing how long the telescope had been looking around and able to detect them, we could estimate that actually they're fairly common because this telescope can't see much of the sky. It's looking in that direction. The chances of seeing one are really small. You see one of these flashes, you know they must actually be happening a lot. And so we could estimate pretty early on that this is something very common on the sky. It's been happening. We just haven't had the technology to detect it before 2007. Uh, we think that roughly speaking, it happens if you could look everywhere in the sky in 24 hours, you'd see about a thousand of these things. So they're coming from out, from, from, you know, far, as I also explain, they're not just coming from the atmosphere and they're not just coming from the solar system or even our galaxy. They're actually, we now know they're coming from the farthest reaches of the universe. And I'm going to explain to you why. We don't know what's causing them. 
So that's the mystery. We do not know the origin of fast radio bursts. Uh, one thing we can say is they are not microwave ovens. And you might wonder why I'm saying that, and I will explain what I mean by that. Uh, so, uh, you know, sometimes if you Google this, you'll see images that, that in the popular press, they made pictures like this. What does a fast radio burst look like? Uh, this is not what a fast radio burst looked like. You can't see the radio waves, okay, just to get, get clear. But, uh, you know, you, you might imagine uh, something coming from a distant object and, and making the signal in a telescope, but you, you can't actually see it with your eyes. This is what we see. So you could say, well, how do you see these things? Uh, this is a, uh, the classic technical plot. Uh, and let me, let me break it down for you so that you understand what you're looking at, because this is a beautiful fast radio burst. This is the, the first one ever discovered by, um, it was actually discovered by my, this colleague of mine and his collaborators, Duncan Lorimer. That's the Lorimer burst. Uh, he's actually a professor at uh, West Virginia University. So what's plotted here is time on the x-axis, where this is the whole x-axis here is just half of a second, half a second. And on the y-axis here are lots and lots of different frequencies of radio waves. This is uh, the, the, the telescope, unlike the radio that I showed you before, the radio you tune to choose one radio frequency to listen to, whereas a radio telescope can listen to them all at the same time all at the same time. And that's what's plotted here. Every single horizontal line here is a different radio frequency. And in fact, this horizontal line is actually a television station. So it's, it's, it's annoying for astronomers, we don't like that, but, but that's fine. We can filter that out afterward. And, and the signal is actually this, this sweep here. So there's a, um, the time goes on and any radio frequency suddenly, boop, there's something and then uh, nothing. And it happens, you see, uh, at the highest radio frequencies first. So it arrives a few, about a quarter of a second uh, at the highest radio frequencies and then comes down. That's really, really important. The signal arrives at the different colors of radio waves arrive at different times. And it, it arrives, it sweeps through. But if you collect this data, and we do, we record it using computers, we digitize it and record it on, on disks, and then we can put it into our software, and then we can remove this de these delays, uh, this, this delay, and, and return the signal to how it was launched. And I'll explain that we know that all of these colors are, uh, were launched from the source at the same time. This is, I'll, I'll explain what this is, but if you remove this delay, this is what you get. You get noise first, you get the burst, and then noise and nothing else, and it's gone. And that is what we see, that is the burst. One flash of radio waves and it's gone. Although the different colors of radio waves, they take a little bit of time uh, to come, uh, different times to come in. And so what I'm gonna say is the reason I'm emphasizing the way it sweeps through the radio frequencies is because that is what is telling us that this event originated from the farthest reaches of the universe. This is what's telling us that we know it's not from the solar system or even the neighborhood of the sun or even our galaxy. It's from far outside our galaxy. And like I said, Hi, what does that have to do? I'm going to explain. I will explain. First of all, let's just set the scale here. Um, we live in a galaxy. That's not the galaxy that we live in. You can know that because it's very hard to take a, a photograph of your house if you're inside the house. You can't take a picture of the outside. So this is some other galaxy that's a lot like the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. It's a, a lovely spiral galaxy that has stars and, and dust and things like that. Um, this is, if we lived in, pretend this is the Milky Way galaxy, uh, our sun, our solar system is kind of far out on the edge. Uh, you are here. That's just to set, set the picture of what it means to be in the galaxy. So when I say, you know, the, the sun is, is tiny, just a speck on this, on this scale here. Uh, but we live in a spiral galaxy. Um, and just to explain, when I say it comes to the farthest reaches of the universe, let's be sure everybody's on the same page about what 
the universe actually consists of. And so this is showing you the scale of the universe. So I think everybody recognizes the earth here, but if you zoom way out uh, away from the earth to past the orbit of Pluto, um, here's what you would see. You can, you can barely see it, but if you could see the little red smudge there, that's pointing back at the earth and the sun is in the middle there and uh, you have all the planets of the solar system there. That's a, so that's the solar system scale. Now, if you zoom way out of the solar system scale, you could fly in your spaceship way out. This is the interstellar neighborhood. So uh, the red smudge there is uh, just the entire solar system as one dot. You zoom out and you can see all the neighboring stars, the closest stars to us, like Proxima Centauri is one of the closest stars. Well, that's, the, that's the interstellar neighborhood. Now, if you zoom way out of the interstellar neighborhood in your spaceship, then you come to the scale of the Milky Way galaxy. And, and here we are you know, at the edge of the spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. But now if you zoom way out of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and now the Milky Way is this little smudge over here. This is now the local galactic group. So we're the entire Milky Way galaxy is just one smudge in a whole group of galaxies. Galaxies. Uh, this is, if anybody's familiar with the Andromeda galaxy, that's, uh, that's over here. That's actually a, a, it's an object you can see in the night sky if you know where to look. It's, pretty, it's dim in a very dark uh, environment. You can see it. Then if you zoom way out of the local galactic group, uh, you get to the uh, Virgo supercluster. So the entire local galactic group is now just a smudge on this scale uh, so with, with lots of other uh, groups of galaxies clustering around it. And then, of course, this, if you could zoom way out uh, on this scale, uh, now the entire supercluster of galaxies, uh, including our <laughs> one local galactic group, well, that entire supercluster is now just one of many many superclusters of galaxies. And then if you could zoom to the largest scale in the universe, this supercluster of galaxies is just one smudge of many superclusters of galaxies. And so when I say that fast radio bursts are coming from the farthest reaches in the universe, I mean on this scale. I mean that they are coming from uh, you know, distances where the entire universe, uh, you know, you'd have to zoom way back, not just far outside the Milky Way, not just far outside the local galactic group, way outside the, um, the local, even superclusters. So they're very, very far away. Now, how do I know this? How can I claim this? How do you know? So let me explain. First, I just want to remind you of a phenomenon that you're very familiar with, uh, the dispersion of light. So uh, white light, like kind of like the light that comes in the sun. Well, the sun's a little yellowish, but still, it's actually made up of many colors. And you know this because you can take, you know, say a, a white flashlight or something and spread it through something that disperses the light into its constituent colors, the colors of the rainbow. Uh, and in fact, here's the rainbow. What the rainbow is, is sunlight being dispersed by water droplets in the atmosphere. The water droplets act like little prisms. And under the right circumstances and the right geometry, you'll see the rainbow. The different colors get spread out when light passes through glass or water or some medium, some material that's transparent, but it causes the direction to change. So the direction depends on the color. So the light comes in this way and purple gets sent out that way and red gets sent out that way. What's not obvious from these pictures is that something else is happening to the light. It's not just the angle changes. It's not just deviating geometrically. It's also changing in time. So that light traveling in a material like water or glass, the different colors actually travel at different speeds. So different colors travel at different speeds and we call that dispersion because the Speed of light in a material depends on the frequency. And you might say, wait a minute. You thought light travels at the speed of light. Uh, you know, a cosmic 
it's not just a good idea, it's the law, according to Albert Einstein. And that is, that is true. But here I'm telling you, wait, they travel at different speeds of depending on colors. Ah, equals this, the C in equals MC squared, the, the speed of light, uh, that's, that's only a constant in a vacuum. So if, you're, if you have light traveling in a medium, uh, that depends, the speed will depend on the color of the light. That's very important uh, for, for what I'm talking about. And you might say, wait a minute, why does that matter? It's not like the universe is filled with water. It's not like the universe is a giant glass universe. It's, it's a vacuum out there. The, why doesn't Einstein's law you know, apply to light coming from distant galaxies? And, and, and it, it doesn't because space is not a vacuum. So there's lots of stuff in space. Uh, it's dilute gas, very dilute. So you wouldn't want to go and try and breathe there. That would be a bad idea. But, um, you know, the Milky Way galaxy, this is actually dust. And there's, there's material between the stars. And in particular, throughout, in, in the space between stars where you might think it's a vacuum, there's lots of electrons. There's lots of free electrons around in the space between stars and even a little bit, time, a lot less, but in the space between galaxies, there are electrons there. The free electrons, they're everywhere in the Milky Way. And so, uh, and, and it so happens that radio waves get dispersed by free electrons. So, you know, what a prism is to white light, Free electrons are to radio waves, and radio waves will disperse. Uh, sorry, free electrons will disperse radio waves. And so, again, here's another you know, picturing spiral galaxy. I want to show you um, what this is. This is pretend this is the Milky Way. This is now a map that astronomers have made that shows the distribution of free electrons, of electrons in our galaxy. So we've made maps of the, 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 the amount of electrons, numbers of electrons throughout the Milky Way galaxy. So we're looking now down on the Milky Way and you see there's lots of electrons distributed in the, in the spiral arms of the galaxies. And you see, we think there might be actually quite few in the center, we're not sure about that, but the rest you see there's a disk here. And, and um, we, we quantify this. This is, this is not just a picture. We can actually quantify it by making a, 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 contour, a contour map. Um, so this, this picture is a little technical, but see if you can understand. If you're looking down on the Milky Way galaxy, just like you'd be he looking here, these lines are just sort of a, a, a scientist's way of conveying spiral arms. And uh, this would be the center of the galaxy. And the little Pac-Man here, that's actually the, the solar system, the region around the solar system. And these lines are showing you uh, lines of, like, is this, and you have a contour plot of, uh, of uh, altitude or something. They're lines that, you know, you see lines of constant altitude. If you're going hiking, you wanna go up a mountain, you look what the altitude is. Here, these are lines of, of constant uh, numbers of electrons. Uh, coming uh, between us and the, and the earth. And you don't really have to understand this, but the main point is that we have this very well mapped out and we know where all the electrons are in our galaxy. And in particular, we know in any direction, the maximum number of electrons. We have a, a wonderful map that tells us where all the electrons are. So we know from the Milky Way galaxy, how many electrons there are in any one direction. And that's really, that's really important for this talk. We, we, um, we use those free electrons to understand how radio waves get dispersed. And the number of electrons between us and some source determines how much dispersion you're gonna see. So for example, you know, here's, here's you know, space. And imagine each dot here is not a star, but perhaps imagine that, you know, the elect lots of electrons here, and you're gonna, an astrophysical source is gonna appear. And, and imagine it's like a, a flashlight, so it's producing white light. You're gonna see a burst of white light. And as it travels, because the speeds of the different colors are different, 
the, 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 the white light's going to turn into the colors of the rainbow. It's going to split it just like a prism does. So there's your FRB. There's a source. Uh, and you see the blue is fastest. So it arrives at Earth first, and then the red does. And that's dispersion. And so I've shown it to you in, in colors that you can see with your eyes. But when I talk about fast radio bursts, it's the same thing just with radio waves. And that's why when you see a burst of radio waves, the highest frequency arrive at Earth first because their speed is actually faster traversing through free electrons in the galaxy and elsewhere. Anyway, so if, if you follow, if you follow, oops, oh, you could watch it again, it's kind of cool. This little animation that somebody at my university made for us. So now just coming back to this Lorimer burst, now I'm gonna to explain to you how we know that it's coming from the farthest reaches of the universe. This, the amount of dispersion here is, um, we can measure it. So if this thing was really close to us, there wouldn't be much dispersion and everything would arrive at the exact same time. This would be a vertical line in the plot. The fact that the, the amount of delay that we see here, that's telling us how much material it's traveled through. And, um, the max, and from our maps of the Milky Way galaxy, we know what's the maximum in that direction. We know how much material, how many free electrons there are in the Milky Way galaxy, how much dispersion you could possibly have. And that's in our, in our crazy numbers, the number is 25. And don't worry about it, but it's the, 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 the degree of dispersion you would expect to have just from the Milky Way galaxy alone is 25. Whereas this burst, the amount of sweep you see here is 375, like over 10 times uh, what you can possibly hope to get out of our Milky Way galaxy. And this, when we saw this, when Lorimer and his colleagues saw this, they were shocked because it didn't seem physically possible. All, any radio signals we'd ever seen like this were from sources in the Milky Way galaxy. This had to be coming from far, far outside the Milky Way galaxy. And knowing that out, once you leave the Milky Way, the number of free electrons drops in, in, between galaxies is very few. So you know to, to get up to this number, to get all this dispersion, it has to be really far away in the universe. And um, if it's really, really far away, and yet we can still detect it on Earth, that means it has to be really, really bright. It has to be a powerful, violent source that has had a titanic explosion to produce radio waves that are detectable at Earth from such a large distance. It must be very, very bright. Now, Parks, the Parkes telescope dis discovered the Lorimer burst and then a few other events like this. But some of them were kind of weird. Some of them looked a little bit different, like this one here. Uh, you see this, this sort of dispersion sweep that I've described to you, and this is the de-dispersed burst. If you, if you correct for it in software and you line it all up vertically, that's what you see, but it was kind of weird and clumpy and, and didn't look like the others. And it actually, so it had this strange frequency sweep and um, it actually differed in other properties as well. Uh, it was, some of them were just a little bit odd and, and they, nobody could quite figure out what this was for a while until somebody, a graduate student, went and, and made a, showed the distribution of events that were weird, which are the gray ones, the ones that are weird, which had the strange frequency sweeps, and the ones which were not so weird, those are the dark gray ones. And what they notice is that the dark gray ones, the ones that have the normal frequency sweeps, happen randomly during the day, whereas the ones that had strange frequency sweeps happen preferentially at lunchtime. And you know, cosmic sources should not really know when it's lunchtime at the telescope. So that was very strange. Uh, that, that's a sign. Uh, and what they realized is that uh, all these anomalous events, they were peaked here. 
because they were coming from, uh, so there's the telescope, and then there's the visitor's quarters where the astronomers sleep, and there's a kitchen there, and you can heat up your lunch in a microwave. And it turns out that when you, when the microwave oven is operating and you don't stop it, but you open it prematurely, you're really hungry and you're not patient, and you open the microwave oven door really quickly, it produces a burst of radio waves that's dispersed. Uh, or we, and no, it's not unclear why it does that, not expected, but it was tested. It, we, there was a graduate student standing at the microwave oven, you know, with a chart and the stopwatch, okay, now, and the telescope was pointed. Also, the telescope had to be pointed at the kitchen. So that wasn't always happening. Uh, but open it, close it, open it, close it. And they showed, bing, 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 yes, the microwave oven was causing these things. Uh, but only, only the weird ones, not, not, the, not the normal ones. And so, um, yeah, so this is the telescope. This is, this is happening at parks. You, you can't quite see the visitor center is like uh, on this scale. It's, it's over there. But uh, when it was pointed there, then, then this, and the microwave was opened. And uh, I just think that was, you know, one very surprising aspect of this, because this is, they published that result, that the microwave oven produces these events in one of the most prestigious journals in astrophysics, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And you can see here, um, subsequent tests revealed that a they called them peritons at first because they didn't, they, they made up a funny name, uh, these weird bursts. But anyway, they can be generated when a microwave oven door is open prematurely and the telescope is at an appropriate angle. Uh, you know, I feel very proud of the scientists who did this. You don't usually publish your mistakes, but in science, that's what we do. You figure something out and you tell everybody. We, you know, you, 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 no, no embarrassment here. I think everybody was was really um, very interested to read this probably then at the observatories went and played with their microwaves for a while. But, but importantly, uh, this and other distinct observational differences show that fast radio bursts are excellent candidates for extra galactic sources. So the normal ones randomly in, the sky, uh, randomly in time, not associated with lunch, those are clearly astrophysical. And so the next question is, okay, what are these things? Never mind the weird ones that come from the microwave, what are the real ones? And, um, you know, there's a million different uh, ideas out there. Scientists are very creative trying to explain these things. And, and for a while, there, there were more published theoretical ideas for what fast radio bursts are than there were events detected uh, by Parks. You know, are there stars colliding that make a big radio burst? Or are there, um, you know, a neutron star colliding with a black hole? Or uh, they thought about comets or asteroids hitting neutron stars or black holes evaporating or all sorts of different models. Um, one of the leading models is that there's an object called magnetars. Magnetars, I'll tell you a little bit about. We know these, these are real objects that we know of in, in the Milky Way, certainly in the Milky Way galaxy. Fast radio bursts would have to be magnetars at other galaxies. But these are uh, neutron stars uh, that I, I've actually studied quite a bit, as it was mentioned. But anyway, uh, neutron stars are collapsed, very dense objects, close cousins of black holes, except they have surfaces that you can observe, and we do. Um, and there is a class of these objects that has the largest magnetic fields that we know of in the universe. And they tend to like to explode a lot. Uh, we see this today all the time, not all the time, every Every year or two, we'll see a magnetar explosion. With, uh, it produces X-rays and gamma rays, which we observe with X-ray and gamma ray telescopes. Um, now, I say these magnetars, they produce large explosions in X-rays and gamma rays. But here I'm talking about radio waves. And until, you know, from these... X-ray and gamma ray explosions had been observed for many years, and there was no sign of any radio explosions from them. So they were not, have not been known for large radio bursts. So you might say, well, then why would they be responsible for these extra galactic huge radio bursts? And there's, there's a few arguments why. They just, uh, they have, certainly have enough energy. And, and I'll come back to why we think they, the magnetars are the best model today. Um, there's about by the, a couple dozen of these objects known in the galaxy. 
So they, they're quite well studied. Uh, now you might say, okay, so you have these fast radio bursts, one goes off. Why don't you just look where it came from and see what's there? So why, why don't you look and see, is there a galaxy there? Does it come from a galaxy like ours? And the problem is that a telescope like the Parkes telescope, it sees the sky, but it sees quite a large region of the sky. It has kind of blurry vision. So it can only say it came from roughly over there. The Parkes telescope, something like the size of the full moon, that, that's the size of the region of the sky that it can say that the FRB came from. And, and if you look at a region like that, so the Parkes telescope, it, it could say, oh, it came from a region of the sky about this size. Um, there's a thousand galaxies in there it could, could it come from. It's a problem. You can't know which galaxy it came from. You don't know, is it like a spiral galaxy like ours or an elliptical galaxy? Is it, how far away is that galaxy? It's hard to know. So we say that the dispersion says it's at, you know, far off in the universe. But how do we really know that's true without seeing what kind of galaxy it came from? And is that galaxy really that far away? And it's a real problem because uh, you know, you can go to larger, if you, if you go to, say, use a larger telescope, and I'll show you the Arecibo telescope is one of, was one of the largest telescopes on Earth. Um, if you go there, you can do a little bit of a better job with a larger telescope. You can pinpoint on the sky a little bit better. Um, but still not, not enough for what, if you, if you want to figure out what galaxy it came from. In order, the sort of telescope that can, um, whoops that can see, uh, can really, really pinpoint it is, is, is uh, that's a telescope that, that can achieve that is called an interferometer. And, uh, you know, I'll show you a picture of an interferometer shortly, like the very large array in New Mexico. It's a wonderful interferometer. The problem with that is these sources are going off all over the sky, but you don't know when and you don't know where. So if you want to look with your telescope, you, you, you know, the, the interferometer, it sees only a tiny piece of the sky at once. It, 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 the chances of it happening to see one of these flashes is, is zero. It, it's, it's hopeless. You, you, it, if you knew where to look, if you knew when it was going to happen, ah, then you could pinpoint it. But you don't know in advance. You have no, you don't, uh, it's a ran, it seems random on the sky. And let me tell you a little bit about the Arecibo telescope, a wonderful, wonderful telescope that's located in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, run by the National Science Foundation. This is a beautiful telescope. Um, the, the dish here is 300 meters across. 300 meters, it's uh, uh, several football fields. This here, if you see, this is a, a beautiful uh, visitor center. <laughs> A, like a lovely science center here that uh, uh, kids uh, all over the island of Puerto Rico uh, come to visit. Um, you can see the parking lot over here. It's a very, very large structure is what I'm trying to convey. The radio waves come down and bounce off the dish and into this structure here where uh, there's a dish inside this dome uh, that's not that much smaller than the Parkes telescope itself you know, uh, a little smaller, but you can, you can have a hundred people walking on this, this structure. And in fact, um, so this is a catwalk. So you can, you can walk on this catwalk or you used to be able to walk on this catwalk uh, and go up here and then wander around here. And, and, uh, and here's a picture. That's me and a couple of colleagues standing at the very top of that structure uh, over here. You can see the catwalk behind us. And if you zoom in there, you see our knuckles are white because it is, it is very scary to be up there, or it was very scary to be up there. Um, and you might've actually seen this telescope because it was, it's been in lots of movies. So I don't know if any of you are James Bond fans. Yeah, so it was in um, James Bond Goldeneye, starring Pierce Brosnan. Uh, and in the movie, you can see him uh, running on that catwalk. Uh, but it, it wasn't actually Pierce Brosnan. It was his stunt double uh, because Pierce Brosnan was, was too scared to do it. And so I like to say, uh, you know, I've done things that James Bond was too scared to do. 
Uh, but anyway, um, at Arecibo, we detected a fast radio burst. So until this time when we were uh, when we detected this, all the fast radio bursts had been detected as seen with the Parkes telescope only. And we were very worried, um, oh, maybe it's something in their software, maybe it's something in their hardware. Uh, but then we detected one in Arecibo, and there you can see that telltale dispersive sweep um, in the frequency versus time plot. Uh, and then something amazing happened. Oh, well, actually something horrible happened, which is the Arecibo telescope collapsed. Uh, about I don't know, a year, you may have seen this in the news. Uh, first, a piece fell off and broke the dish. Uh, and then not long after that, the, uh, one, one of these cables snapped and the whole thing fell. And uh, it's really a, a, a tremendous loss for science, tremendous loss for uh, astronomy. But um, one of the discoveries we made before, <laughs> before it collapsed was that fast radio burst detected at Arecibo uh, repeats. So all of the parks bursts that had been seen, they had stared at that part of the sky again and again and never seen the burst again. The Lenormer burst has never come back. But the Arecibo burst that we detected, I had a PhD student who was very diligent. Uh, we would collected lots of data. We didn't think we'd see anything because the parks people hadn't. But then on one day, we were observing it and it burst 10 times within an hour. So this was a shock. And uh, that's the PhD student who, who made the discovery, Paul Schultz. Um, and boy, did that get a lot of press at the time. Uh, you know, the cosmic hunt for fast radio bursts just got a surprising new twist because if you're wondering what these things are and you think, oh, maybe it's two colliding stars. Well, colliding stars cannot collide 10 times in an hour. Like that makes no sense anymore. That got rid of half of the models that had been pr proposed for fast radio bursts. You know, in one, in one discovery, one day, suddenly Paul knew, and then he emailed all of us. It's none of those, none of those sources. Um, that was pretty exciting. So right away, it's scientific discovery in a day, but by having a source that repeats, that you know it, it goes off and off, that, uh, off it, it'll, it'll burst many times, that, not only did it rule out half the models, the theories for what these are, it also allowed us to then go to an interferometer telescope because then we could tell it where to point and, and just wait and watch. And so this is the very large array in New Mexico. That's an array that's from, seen from the sky. These are uh, something like each dish is an aperture. I, I forget, something like 85, 80 feet or something like that. Very, very large. Uh, uh, array of telescopes all working in unison. And we got it, we, we went there and we said, okay, could you please, please, we, we have to write a proposal, of course, and explain, just stare at that part of the sky where Arecibo saw this burst go off and wait, because then this thing could pinpoint where it came from on the sky exactly. And then we can go see, is there a galaxy there? So that's what we did. And, and um, we waited uh, 60 hours of telescope time, which is a lot of time. It's very competitive to get time here. And we saw no bursts. And that was very sad, and we were very frustrated. And uh, we begged them for a little bit more time, please. And, and they said, okay, try again. And then, boom. So after the, then, as a couple months later, they gave us more time. And in the first hour, the thing burst. And boy, was that exciting. Um, this is a map of the sky. And, and don't worry too much about what the star means. That's just the pinpoint of where it came from. The, the circles are where Arecibo said to look. Those are the regions. And, and then when the boom happened, that told us it, it's coming from exactly that spot on the sky. And that was uh, super exciting because we, we pinpointed it. We knew from the VLA that it had exactly the same sort of sweep that we saw at Arecibo. We knew it was the same source um, because it had the exact amount of uh, dispersion in it. So that was super exciting. And then and then actually we, we detected nine more bursts at the VLA in the, in the next few days. So that was uh, nine bursts that was in 2016 caught with the VLA and that gave us a very precise position. And so then we could next pivot and call up the optical telescope people and say, hey, can you give us some optical time? And we did, we got on the, the giant um, eight meter Gemini telescope in Hawaii. We said, can you, can you 
please, let's look over there and see if there's a galaxy. And this is now the optical image that we got with the Gemini telescope. Uh, and boy, were we underwhelmed. So this was another surprise to us. We thought we'd look, at, we'd look and there'd be a beautiful spiral galaxy or something like the Milky Way. And instead it was this puny little nothing galaxy uh, that we call, that, that it turns out there's lots of these in the, in the universe, little puny galaxies, they call them dwarf galaxies. And, and that was quite a shock, except that we could measure the distance to this galaxy. From the stars in the galaxy, there's ways of measuring distances. And it is very far away in the universe, exactly as the dispersion had predicted. So we had an independent way to determine the distance of the fast radio burst. And it agreed completely with everything we had surmised from the dispersion of the radio waves. And that was very gratifying uh, at the time. Uh, and so definitely a cosmological distance. That was very nice. Uh, and this is actually a, a postdoc at, Ma at McGill University named Sri Harsh Tendulkar who did this work. And we got a whole bunch of other press there. The New York Times wrote all about us. Um, radio burst traced to a faraway galaxy. Uh, but the caller is probably ordinary physics. And I was kind of ticked with the writer, famous writer, Dennis Overby, who wrote that. And I thought to myself, boy, I'd like to bring an FRB to his home in the middle of the night and explode it and see just how ordinary he finds that. Um, but simultaneously, around, uh, the New York Post <laughs> wrote, um, yeah, they could be aliens. Like, no, that's not, that's not true at all. I don't know where they got that. Um, in any case, since that time, uh, uh, our colleagues in Australia using a different set of telescopes called the, the ASCAP collaboration, uh, the Australian Telescope uh, Collaboration, Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, never mind, their telescope um, has detected uh, something like a, a little bit more than a dozen more fast radio bursts. And their telescope, because it's an array, is able to pinpoint pretty well. And it's found a whole bunch more fast radio bursts coming from otherwise normal galaxies, not dwarf galaxies. So fast radio bursts do not only come from dwarf galaxies, they also come from normal type galaxies. And that is also puzzling to us, okay? So they can come from any type of galaxy. Interesting. Um, so, that's kind of where we were before 20, 2000, 2019. We knew at least one fast radio burst could repeat. The others had not seen, been seen to repeat. That ruled out a whole bunch of uh, models for what these objects are. It enabled the first localization and the first host galaxy determination, but it left lots of questions open. Like, do they all repeat and you, you just have to wait long enough? Or, um, you know, and what is the bursting source? What's causing the explosions? And why was one in a tiny galaxy uh, and others uh, in bigger galaxies? And you just, when you have just a handful, it's really hard to answer these kind of questions. You just, you don't know. And so what we then decided is we need to find more of them. But the question is, how do you find more? Uh, it's a very hard problem because if they're happening randomly all over the sky, you need a telescope that can see everywhere all the time. Uh, and, and what kind of telescope can do that? But well, we built one in Canada, something that can do exactly that. It's called the um, CHIME telescope, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. CHIME. And here it is, it's in British Columbia in the Okanagan Valley, beautiful wine country, very, very lovely place to visit. Um, this doesn't look like a telescope to you, but it is a telescope. It is. When each of these is, this is a cylinder, these are cylinders, a um, hundred meters long and 20 meters wide, each of these cylinders is. Um, there's no moving parts to this telescope. It, it just sits there and watches the sky overhead as it rotates due to the earth rotation. So the earth is rotating and the sky goes by and it's watching uh, in radio waves and, and Hanging here underneath the, the axis here uh, are hundreds of antennas that are sensitive to radio waves. Uh, and uh, collecting data 24 hours a day in an automated fashion and searching for fast radio bursts. Now, the name has hydrogen intensity mapping 
that has nothing to do with fast radio bursts. And that's because this telescope was designed for a totally different purpose by colleagues of mine. I, I wasn't involved in the design at all uh, for, a, for a very different astronomical purpose. Um, having to do with measuring hydrogen in the distant universe. But it so happens this telescope, at the same time, the designers were geniuses. It's so useful for, you can do this kind of transient science, a science where you don't know where you're looking when, at the same time as the cosmology, at the same time as the hydrogen observations. Uh, and this was all for, well, it's at numbers, actually, this is an old slide. It's more like $18 million, but 18 million Canadian dollars. This is a kind of cheap, Cheap experiment. Um, and there is the fast radio burst team standing in the axis of the telescope. Um, uh, just to give you the sense of scale, how big this object is, the, the total area of the telescope in, I like to say in Canadian units is about five hockey arenas, uh, just to you know, set the, that scale. And you might say, well, why cylinders? Why would you put cylinders? What's the point of that? So a conventional telescope like Parkes, it sees a tiny little region on the sky, which is not so great for detecting sources that come and go and where you don't know where they're gonna be. It's gonna miss most of them. Occasionally it'll get lucky and it'll see something will hit there, but most of the time it doesn't. But a cylinder on the other hand, a cylinder can see a very large area on the sky because it's not focusing in, the, in, the, in this direction. And so it can see a much larger area of the sky and it has a much greater chance of detecting a transient source. So this is the you know, field of view of the Parkes telescope compared to the Chime telescope. And so when you know, transients go off, which they should momentarily, for our transients, there they go, uh, then you get, you get lucky and you get lucky more often. And so the Chime telescope, whereas by 2017, um, there are only a couple dozen uh, tel uh, fast radio bursts detected uh, by, by the Parkes telescope and by my colleague. Um, I'm just going to skip that for a minute. Well, okay, I'll tell you that in a moment, but I'll, I'll just say that um, the telescope works uh, by collecting all the antenna signals and through thousands of cables, putting them into supercomputers. And those supercomputers are located partly under the dish and partly next to the dish. And so um, the, the total data rate being collected by the telescope is comparable to the world's cellular network. It's, for those of you familiar with the number 13 terabits a second is being processed constantly 24 seven in real time. And we're searching for fast radio bursts in real time because we cannot save all that data. We have to find them and, and write them uh, and, and save them to computer disk. Um, now, just to explain to you, well, you might say, okay, if you, if you have just one antenna hanging on a cylinder like this, then you see a large area of the sky, it's true, but you don't know where in that large area of the sky the source occurred. So you could picture this as like, sort of like the sky, one antenna in a cylinder will see a big area, uh, but you don't know where in that area it could happen here or here or here or here, you don't know where. So that's not so helpful. But if you put lots of antennas and you hang them on your cylinder, then compute, in the computer, you can um, uh, pinpoint where on the sky the event, might have, uh, the event came from. And then if you populate all of your antennas uh, with all of your cylinders with antennas, then both in the, this is the north-south direction and the east-west direction, you can actually see on the sky uh, where the signal came from. So it's kind of like having, in our case, we have 1,024 of these antennas, which translates to 1,024 positions on the sky that we can look at for fast radio bursts. So it's like having 1,024 Parkes telescopes all operating simultaneously 24-7. Uh, so it's, it's just a vast amount of data um, that we're searching for fast radio bursts. I'm gonna skip these slides for a minute. Um, so we started detecting fast radio bursts in 2018, and they're very proud that they put us on the cover of Nature Magazine, Space and Chime, haha, -ha, that's kind of funny. Um, and let me show you some of our first detections. We were very, very excited. Um, we saw you know, some with funny peaks and some 
straight ones and some, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, bright ones and some dim ones. Uh, and then we found the second repeating FRB. So the question, you know, was the repeater this anomaly? The Arecibo repeater? No, we found another one. Uh, and this is, it turns out it's really easy to find repeaters when you're staring at the sky 24 seven, because the same sky comes back every single day. And if there's something bursting every day, it's really easy to find it. And we've been cleaning up. We've now found 20 repeaters on the sky. It's a whole population that we're able to, to see. And in fact, we're, we're, we have a lot more that we're about to publish. Uh, this is a plot that shows as a function of year when fast radio bursts have been detected. This is the first, the first one was a warmer burst that actually the data were from 2001. Uh, you can see the gray ones are all the Parkes telescope and a few other telescopes found some. There's my colleagues at ASCAP in Australia also that found some. Uh, and then in 2018, the Chime telescope turned on. And this is what the distribution looks like, looked like then. Um, so yeah, there's ASCAP down there, but now we're, because we have this massive field of view because of this crazy cylindrical geometry of the telescopes, uh, we, we, we can uh, detect over, the, over a year, we detect thousand of them. And we now, we're now up to about 3,000. We've been operating for about 3, 000, three years. Um, and so here we started discovering all these different repeating sources. Um, and one of the things that we have noticed, the most fast radio bursts do not repeat, or at least we have yet to see them repeat, but a few of them repeat. And one thing we've noticed is that they're, the characteristics, these are bursts from different repeating sources. The bursts from different repeaters um, tend to be a little longer, to last a little longer, and also to have strain, more, more structure. So they'll, they'll tend to have multiple peaks. And they also tend to be narrower in frequency range than the, uh, the sources that don't repeat. And so that seems to be a clue. Is that, that's a clue that maybe they are uh, different classes of objects, maybe fast radio bursts. It's not all one type of source making fast radio bursts. Maybe some repeat and some are something else and don't repeat. And they have different property, radio properties. That's a possibility. Um, another big event happened in 2020, just after COVID started, by the way, we were locked down, but the telescope, it's, it's automatic. You just log in. So we were all still observing all the time. In fact, with fewer distractions, we got tons of work done. Um, and in April of 2020, we saw one of the brightest bursts that we'd ever seen with Chime. This is now, uh, again, time and radio frequency here. We've removed the dispersion. It was actually a double burst. We saw two bursts. And this was from a magnetar that's inside the Milky Way galaxy. So this was a total shock. We didn't think things in our galaxy, we didn't think sources in our galaxy could produce such bright radio bursts. And this, this may not look super bright to you, but um, that's because it wasn't where the telescope was looking. It was off in the side. We call it the side lobes of the telescope. That means an antenna has, you know, it, it can detect mainly what's over there, but it has a little tiny bit of sensitivity, not directly overhead. And the source was way off, and yet it was so incredibly bright. If it had been overhead, it, it, you know, you, you would have been so bright that, you know, you, you wouldn't have seen any noise or anything. It would just be humongous. But anyway, something was by far the brightest radio burst um, in terms of, you know, energy that we have seen in, from our, in our galaxy. And that was uh, very, so it's from a magnetar. And, and the amount of energy that was released from a magnetar in our own galaxy, if you could take that magnetar and put it in a nearby galaxy, it would look just like a fast radio burst. So it suggests that the fast radio burst that we detect could, maybe those are extra galactic you know, magnetars in other galaxies. Um, it could be, it could be. We don't know that all fast radio bursts are magnetars, but maybe some are. Um, this actually got us a lot of accolades. I'll just, uh, just very proud of this for our team. 
Um, Nature Magazine mentioned us as among the uh, top 10 remarkable discoveries of 2020. And, and actually, Science Magazine did as well. Uh, in Science Magazine, they listed the top 10 results. Um, we were behind uh, the COVID vaccine. COVID vaccine was number one. And, and I feel like, okay, fair enough. Like, uh, that's just, I, I agree with, I totally agree. Um, so this is a little bit more technical. I'm just wrapping up the talk now, but just for, for aficionados and the audience, could all fast radio bursts be magnetars, but magnetars on the far reaches of the, of the universe? Could that be the case? And we don't know the answer to that yet. So this is a plot that's showing, you know, distance. This is a logarithmic scale. That means these are factors of 10 going out, like as if you're zooming in that spaceship, like I showed you earlier in the talk, how far out you'd have to go. This is the scale of the galaxy. This is here in the galaxy. And these are all sources in the galaxy that we've seen. This is now at the very edge of the universe, you know, billions of light years away. And this is where the fast radio bursts live. And these lines here are lines of constant energy of bursts. And, uh, you know, all the sources in our galaxy were very low energy compared to the fast radio bursts, which are much higher energy. But the burst, the magnetar burst that we witnessed in April of 2020 was by far the greatest, most, the brightest radio burst. And in terms of energy, it just is, the, it's like the lowest energy FRB we've ever seen. So it's comparable to the lowest energy fast radio burst we've ever seen, but there's a million, uh, a factor of a million in scale here. So it would have to be, the, the brightest FRBs would have to be magnetars that are a million times brighter than the one we observed in our galaxy. And it's possible, maybe magnetars can do that, but we don't know that for sure. So that's where we are. Um, and the last thing I will tell you is that, you know, it's really interesting to know what galaxy these things came from. It tells you, you know, is it a young galaxy, is it an old galaxy? How far away is the galaxy? All of these things are very important for us. But Chime, the Time Telescope is really good at finding fast radio bursts, but it's not good at pinpointing them. When you find a repeating source, then you can go to an interferometer and you can do it. But uh, Chime itself is not good. Uh, Chime itself alone is not good at pinpointing them, which is why the next step we think in this whole puzzle, solve this puzzle, is we are building mini Chime telescopes uh, around North America including here in the United States. Uh, here's the North America map. This is where Chime is located in British Columbia. And we've already built a second, uh, a second cylinder uh, about 100 kilometers away from uh, Chime in Allenby, British Columbia. And we're in the process of building one in Green Bank, West Virginia, at the site of the National Radio Observatory uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in, in, uh, in Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, it's a radio quiet zone, very nice area for, for radio telescopes. And another one in California at Hat Creek at the site of the SETI Institute, the, uh, the institute where they have radio telescopes to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and the idea is uh, it, 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 each of these telescopes will be watching the same part of the sky as Chime. And it won't be collecting the data, it'll be briefly collecting it, but constantly just buffering the data. We say buffering, saving the data until Chime says, I see one. And then quickly all those telescopes will dump their data and we'll use this whole, these telescopes as a giant interferometer. And that will allow us to pinpoint every Chime fast radio burst, whether it's repeating or not, um, on the sky and identify their host galaxies. And so that is, that is the next step in this. And we're hoping by having a thousand, we hope we'll be able to ho identify host galaxies for over a thousand fast radio bursts and then collect the statistics and see what fraction are in old galaxies versus young galaxies and, and know exactly the energies for all of these sources. Uh, we hope that will help us uh, unravel uh, the mystery of fast radio bursts. So um, from the Chime Fast Radio Burst Project and from my co colleagues all over the world who are trying to solve this mystery, I say stay tuned, and I will leave you with a, um, a video uh, taken by a drone uh, of the Chime Telescope uh, in the Okanagan Valley in Canada. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Caspi. It's been a, a wonderful, wonderful lecture. You've taken a discovery story and shown us the detective story behind it and made it all very entertaining and very accessible. And thank you very much for doing that. Um, Jan, quick question. Do our Zoom participants have the ability to put a question in the chat? No, they don't. Okay, so we have time for some questions from the audience. So, questions. On the last slide of the, the chime outriggers, you said once the, the main chime spots one of these FRBs, the others immediately, can, can they do that within the millisecond of the, of the burst or how? Um, so time, you no, know, it takes a few seconds for, the tele, for our software to recognize an event has happened, but we will ensure that each outrigger is buffering enough data uh, that uh, it, we won't miss it. So it, it will take a little bit of time to, to tell them, but not that long, like okay. within 10, 20 seconds, they'll have the signal, they'll dump their data. This is all being built right now by the uh, team of amazing students and postdocs and a few and several professional uh, staff uh, up in Canada and, uh, and elsewhere also. So we have colleagues uh, in, uh, here in the United States too at MIT and uh, uh, West Virginia University. I don't have everybody's logo up there, I should. Other questions? If you just to put things into perspective in terms of size, a couple of days ago, there was a, there was a very energetic solar flare, like a, a coronal mass ejection. Yes. What would be the comparison in the magnitude of energy released in one of the fast radio burst events compared to something like that from our own sun? Uh, so, I, so I'd love like a pencil and paper to work that out, but it, off the top of my head, what I'd say Order is... Order of magnitude, physics number. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I know magnetar giant flares uh, can be, uh, can release um, uh, as much energy as the sun does, including all coronal mass ejections, uh, in, in, as much as the sun does in, in, in 250,000 years. Uh, so now and FRBs are, are, are not, uh, you know, so it would be at least, at least that. So it's, it's much, much like billions of times more energetic. Amazing. Questions? A question here, yeah. Uh, yes, here, let me bring, oh, there's a, a microphone coming your way. Um, so I know that you said that one of the theories we have, it's like magnetars, but like, what are the identifying features of a magnetar? Like, what are we looking for when we like to know it's a magnetar? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a really, really good question. So one of the things, so magnetars, um, they are very young stars. So they're, they're, they, magnetars are typically so I say young, and I mean like 10,000 years old. <laughs> and in and, and astronomy, that's nothing. You know, compared to human lifetime, obviously, that's a long time. But in astronomy, 1,000 or 10,000 years is nothing. And so magnetars are very young objects. So if fast radio bursts were all magnetars, then you would tend to find them in very young galaxies or in um, regions of galaxies where stars are, are being formed. So that would be one it wouldn't be proof that it was definitely a magnetar, but it would be one way to support it. Another way would be if you could look at the direction of a fast radio burst where you know there's a radio explosion, at the same time look with an X-ray telescope and also see an X-ray burst, magnetars make X-ray bursts. So that would be another telltale sign that it was a magnetar if you saw an X-ray burst at the same time as a radio burst. Uh, those are the two big ones. There's, there's other ideas. Um, you know, if it's a magnetar, you know, magnetars don't have these giant bursts. At least the ones in our galaxy, they tend to have the really giant bursts once a decade. Whereas you saw the repeater we detected Arecibo burst 10 times in an hour. So that's not like any magnetar we know of in our galaxy. 
So we suspect, okay, if it was a really like a newly born magnetar, a magnetar that was just born last year, and it's bursting, 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 it should slow down with time. So if we watch over years, you might think the burst rate should be seen to decrease. That's another possibility. There's a few other, there's a few other ways to test the model and, and we're all, you have to be patient and that's what we're doing. Thank you. I wonder if you would maybe speculate as to whether the, I don't know if the, the outflow jets from a magnetar or pulsar could be strong enough to interact with something nearby to cause repeating. Oh, uh, yeah. So one of the ideas for how you produce fast radio bursts is that it's actually sort of uh, um, uh, the magnetar is um, inside a giant ball of, uh, of uh, material, not, not like, uh, not hard material, but uh, a nebula. And, and the reason is that we see magnetars in our own galaxy when they have these giant explosions, we see there's, they actually release some particles, kind of like the sun's coronal mass ejection, it, it releases both light and particles. Um, and so magnetars do that too. And so if you had a young magnetar that was just burr, you know, spitting out tons of stuff, eventually that would build up around the magnetar. And then when the next burst hit, it would slam into it and create a shock. And so that's one model for how these bursts get, get uh, created in the shock uh, uh, with, uh, uh, of the uh, ejecta from one magnetar flare on the material that was existed before that. My colleague, uh, uh, Brian Metzger at Columbia University, and his collaborators have been working on a theoretical model like that. Okay, ah, yes. Microphone coming. All right, thank you. Uh, actually, my question is a little bit out of topic, like, uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, like today, there is like a trend to share the spectrum with, uh, like the radio astronomy or uh, spectrum with other wireless systems. And given that you are working on, you know, you know, you are detecting burst of radios. How will that affect your work? Oh, that's a really important question. Thank you for asking that. Actually, um, yeah. So. Everybody likes their cell phones <laughs> and everybody wants their 5G and they want their, uh, you know, so radio trans terrestrial radio transmissions, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, you think about, you know, light pollution for optical astronomy and radio astronomy, it's, it's way worse because at least for an optical telescope, you can go to a remote location where it's dark and there's not a lot of people around and then you can see the sky. But for radio waves, you know, your GPS wants to be able to find you everywhere on the, anywhere on the planet. And that means there's satellites broadcasting radio waves everywhere. Uh, you know, there's radars, there's, uh, you know, cell phones. So it's a huge problem in radio astronomy. And um, we just have to try and get smarter and filter it out in intelligent ways. And I have PhD students whose, whose job it is to come up with clever, sometimes we use machine learning um, to, to filter out, uh, cause we know what the signal is that we're looking for. So if you can, you can do some artificial intelligence, uh, and we have that in our, in our detection pipelines. Um, but it's a constant battle. And, um, I, I should, I should really mention that just that to raise awareness, uh, people think about just light pollution, but it's it, radio pollution is way worse. And it's, it threatens all of radio astronomy. You know, in, in a few years, it, it might be impossible to do this kind of science if, if we don't have some respect for that. Oh, you have just made a case for chime on the far side of the moon. <laughs> Knew I was going to work that in. Yeah, well, the far side of the moon is the ultimate destination to avoid uh, terrestrial man-made signals. Expensive, though. Any other questions? Oh, one in the back, yes. 
Okay, my question is just how does gravitational lensing come into effect with your work? And is it similar to like working with the CMB? Oh, awesome question. So, um, okay, so this, this is for, for those of you who don't know, I, obviously you're a ringer. So the CMB is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and that is a uh, light that's coming from even beyond where we're taught. So the fast radio bursts are coming from cosmological distances. The CMB is coming from even before that, not long after the Big Bang, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So the CMB, we don't think it interacts much with fast radio bursts. Uh, and, and so we don't think it's much related uh, to that. But now you asked also about gravitational lensing. And so gravitational lensing, for those of you who don't know, is uh, you know, uh, uh, a process that um, where uh, the, uh, uh, an object uh, can act as a lens, um, for, uh, like a, a lens, because uh, the way it distorts space and time around it. So, you know, in um, uh, Einstein's theory is that gravity is actually, uh, you know, the, the reason that the mass, uh, that the Earth makes things fall is because space and time are distorted around the mass. And so that things naturally fall in the same way things travel on a curved path. And so in gravitational lensing, if a mass comes between you and the distant object, that's going to distort the space and time around that the lens and you know cause it sometimes to uh, the, the the distant object to be to, to make a ring on the sky or sometimes to have multiple images uh, and so we actually do think that fast radio bursts could undergo gravitational lensing if some if if, if, if uh, something happens to be passing right between us and them and we have gra a, a graduate student uh, one at, at McGill University and one actually at MIT who are doing exactly that, searching for signatures of gravitational lensing in, in CHIME fast radio burst data. And we are actually in the process of writing a publication about that search. So, so thank you for letting me mention that. Uh, that's a great kind of question. Anything else? If not, I want to thank Professor Caspi again for a wonderful lecture and for coming in person to Washington University to visit us. And we hope that you will come back at some time when we know the cause of these fast radio bursts or even before then. Thank, thank you, you very again. Much. Thank you.